Have you heard? KushCon is headed to Tampa this August 6th and 7th. Network with more than 7,500 hemp and cannabis professionals. Sample products from more than 300 brands. And take in over 70 educational sessions. Do you work in cannabis or hemp? KushCon Tampa is the only place you can meet directly with the nation's largest distributors and retailers. Get tickets and learn more at kush.com slash kushcon. Plus, listeners of this show can save 50% on tickets with the promo code PODCAST. Again, that's kush.com slash kushcon. See you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Deadhead Cannabis Show. I'm Larry Mishkin of Mishkin Law in Chicago, and I am joined by my co-host today, Rob Hunt of Lene Holdings in San Diego. And for those of you who don't know, but if you're listening to this show, of course you know, today is the birthday of Jerry Garcia. And so we are going to have a lot of fun talking about this today. It's an all-Jerry show, and uh, we're going to jump right out of the box here with uh, some Jerry that uh, Rob and I both love a lot. And we'll talk about it in a minute. So, Dan, as soon as you got that music ready, we are ready for it. Welcome, man. It's great to have you back and, you know, great to uh, have you around for this one. This is a great show today. Yeah, I got to tell you, the thing I love about that Shining Star is it was right in the beginning of the second set. That's from Garcia's birthday from August 1st, 1992 from the Irvine Amphitheater. And right before that Shining Star started, uh, the fans uh, started singing Happy Birthday to Garcia. And they actually brought balloons and some other stuff out in front of um, in front of his microphone. And he was tuning up facing the other direction. And when he turned around, he realized that this whole birthday, 50th birthday celebration was set up for him on the stage. And then he broke into the Shining Star. It was one of those amazing moments. So the, the intro to that Shining Star is one of my favorites. And that was kind of during that early 90s period where Shining Star was opening a lot of second sets. So we, we might hear a little bit more of that one later on. But it's just it's, it's such a great way to open the second set, especially on such an amazing night. No, look, there's a lot to say about that, right? First of all, the uh, the song is great. Second of all, that version of Garcia doing it is amazing. And yeah, you're right, where there's going to be a little more of this later on, so don't go away, people, because that that's worth it just for that alone. But let's let's really touch on the, you know, the big freaking elephant here in the room. This show is 40 years old, man. You know, 40 years ago, Garcia was 40 years old. He would have been 80. He would have been 80 years old today. And, um, you know, it's just amazing that um, he's not, but we still have great music for him to listen to. But it is amazing, right? Because we talk about Phil being older than 80 and being out there and jamming and, you know, Mickey and uh, and Billy out there doing their thing. And Bobby's just perpetually young, so he doesn't really count. But man, Garcia, you know, I, I, I try not to, it's not that I try not to think about it, but he's gone. It's a long time that since he's been gone. So we just sit here and we and we move forward and but you hear something like this and it just brings you right back, right? Cause this was just, this was great music at a great time for him. And um, I, I'm so glad you picked this show today. You know, the funny thing about that is that, you know, I remember seeing that show. So that was a run of Garcia band shows that was at like the universal amphitheater in LA and the Ventura candy Fair, fairgrounds in Ventura. And they played the Devore field in uh, Chula Vista, but it, just in the middle of that happened to be Jerry's 50th. And I was 20 years old at the time when he turned 50 and, you know, I remember thinking like, my God, 50, that's so old. And, you know, I just had my 50th birthday a couple months ago and, you know, you and Dan have both had yours and, you know, like there's a, a moment in your life where, where you thought 50 was kind of like a big deal. Like you made it to 50 and then you hit 50 and you're like, all right, it's just another day. Right. But, uh, but I remember thinking like, you know, wow, this guy's, you know, such an old, old rock star. I never thought that like, 
you know, we'd see Mick Jagger play at 80 or see Phil Lesh play at 80 or see a lot of these other guys, you know, the, you know, Robert Plant's still out there doing his thing. So like, you know, the idea that, that 50 was, was old at the time, you know, no longer resonates with me, but looking back at that show, like I was so stoked. I was there for Phil's 50th. You know, I got to be at Garcia's 50th and I, you know, as you know, I'm a much bigger Garcia band fan, like at the end of the day that I am a Grateful Dead fan. So to like be able to see like, you know, a Garcia band tour in Southern California that had his 50th right in the middle of it was amazingly special. Have you, have you ever been to Irvine, Larry? Have you ever been to that venue? I have never been to the venue. I have a lot of good buddies who have been there. My good buddy Mike and my good buddy Siegs have been there. I have never made it to Irvine and uh, would love to. It's, it's on my bucket list of places to go. It, it's such a cool spot. Uh, but let, let me just jump in for one second here and say something because there's a reason why I'm a lawyer and not a mathematician. So I was, of course, at giving him 40 years ago. It's only 30 years ago. So Jerry was 50, not 40, when we listened to that music. So please for, all forgive me for my bad math. Yeah, so um, first of all, you know, like you can go from 30 to 40, Larry. No one's going to give you any shit about it. You have to remember that, you know, uh, you know, ship of fools migrate from 30 years upon my head to 40 years upon my head, uh, you know, from decade to decade. So, you know, your, your addition doesn't mean a big deal. Um, but Irvine, like the cool thing about that spot is it used to have a wild animal park that was attached to it, which meant there was like this lion, um, like wild lion spot. So you'd go in there and like check out the zoo and check out all the stuff that was happening there. And then, um, and, and then go to the show afterwards. So it was actually a really, really fun spot and it was tucked away in the woods. Uh, and it used to be, you know, back in the early nineties was just starting to be developed, but it used to be strawberry fields next to the place and like orange uh, groves. So it was in the middle of nowhere, like not far from Laguna Canyon. And I saw some terrific shows there back in the early 90s. But as far as all the sheds that, you know, I've seen, this one's really tucked away and really um, a, a bit more intimate, I guess, than, than most sheds. So do you think that they uh, purposefully scheduled his birthday show for this location? you think they were that in tune with what was going on? Yeah, and it's a great question. I don't know whether or not it just happened to be whatever the promoter was doing on that tour. But I mean, if, if you were to say, like, what's the best venue on that tour to go see Jerry's birthday? I probably would have picked Ventura because it's on the beach and it's like even better spot than uh, than Irvine was. But the one thing about Irvine is you're able to do fireworks at the venue. And so after the show was over, as you're walking out after the wonderful world, there's blasting fireworks over the back of the venue. So it was, it, it was a really, really cool night. It was a perfect middle of the summer, um, gorgeous, like 80 degree night in Southern California. It, it couldn't have been better. So, you know, really, really pleased that I got to um, spend some time at this show. And as, as a result, you know, knowing it's Jerry's 80th today, uh, I couldn't think of a better show to play than, than his 50th. If it was good 30 years ago, it's still good today. No doubt about it. It's, uh, um, you know, and, and you and I have both talked a lot about our mutual love and respect for the Jerry Garcia band and all of that. And um, it, it, it's so easy to, to, to slot a dead show in here, uh, you know, to find one for Jerry on or around his birthday and or just a bunch of tunes that really celebrate Jerry. But to be able to find a show, you know, of his, it was actually on a birthday. You know, it reminds me uh, uh, of its energy and everything of that, uh, the Bob Weir show from uh, uh, his his birthday, not the, the Grateful Dead show on Bob Weir, Weir's birthday, Nightfall of Diamonds from uh, Brendan Byrne, and I think it was 89 on October 16th. And that was a birthday show, you know? And I th It was, 10, 10, 16, 89. Yeah, and I think that those are fun uh I think that those are fun occasions for those guys. You know, if, if they're going to celebrate, why not be up on stage with, you know, their best friends and, and a room full of the people that adore them, right? It's a, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, no, I agree with you. you know, I think birthday shows are always fun. I think that, um, you know, I guess you always kind of have high, high expectations for them. But at the same time, it's always a good energy. And it's always good to say, you know, you were there for, for sort of a milestone birthday. And, you know, the Brendan Byrne one, I think it was only Bob's 46. It wasn't like a milestone birthday, but it was, you know, still one of those nights that everyone looks back at and says, you know, wow, that, that was a pretty exceptional night. But yeah, I mean, for, I guess it's rare. It's rare, Larry, that we do A, a show on the Garcia Band, but more importantly, it's really rare that, that when we play the song selections, we have an audience recording that we're playing from. And again, you know, you don't have nearly the same access to soundboards with the JGB as you do with uh, the Grateful Dead. So, you know, we did the best we could, but the recording I was able to find, I love because, you know, you can actually hear people during the intro of The Shining Star, you know, singing, uh, yelling happy birthday to Garcia. And there's other times during the show where you can hear, you know, some audience feedback where it's, you know, like whoever did this recording was obviously like close to pretty exuberant fans. And obviously in JGB, there wasn't a taper section. So you're kind of like illegally recording even to the end. So you get, you know, some more audience feedback. But the, the recording quality on this one's great. It just has like has some really funny things that you hear, like the crowd banter. 
um, because of the fact it was Jerry's 50th and just how like excited people were for it. Well, generally speaking, that's what I always loved about audience tapes, right? So, I mean, unless you had sound boards, you know, we pretty much all admit that, you know, the, the sound could be, sometimes it could be great, sometimes not so great. But, you know, you, you were always more interested in making sure you had a recording of a show. So if, you know, a, a tape that was not necessarily a, of the highest quality made its way in at that time, you know, you, you hold on to it until you could get one, uh, you know, that was a better quality. Um, you know, but but for the most part, you know, like you say, that, that was our options for listening to any of this stuff live. And with Garcia, there just wasn't that much, at least in my part of the world, and the tapers that I was dealing with, the emphasis was so heavy on the Grateful Dead. Uh, that we never really got a chance to to hear it. And, you know, when I saw him finally in the summer of 83 in some small little bar across the river from St. Louis, it was like, you know, uh, not that I hadn't already drank the Kool-Aid and gotten heavily on the bus and had seen, God, probably uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about six or seven dead shows already. That just blew me away, uh, you know, to see him in a small venue up there taking charge and, and really hammering it out and to hear it live. And so to be able to really hear him play uh, and you know, I'm sure that there's people who aren't, but for those of us who are dead fans, primarily through, uh, you know, the the love and respect and admiration we have for Garcia and his talent, uh, you know, to be able to hear him in that type of a situation was, you know, that was like, wow, this is, this is, this is where, you know, and I know that the people in the Garcia family don't like this, so I don't try to emphasize it too much, but that's where that feeling of, wow, this guy's like, maybe not a God, but he's up there. This is just incredible that the energy that he pulls out, pushes out into the audience and the songs that he sings. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's he and what the dead did just set the stage for all of these other bands that are out here now, you know, and, and who play to the same format and God love Jerry, man. It's great. And it's great to be able to celebrate him. Yeah, for sure. And I'll tell you the, the other thing I loved about the Garcia band. And obviously like for me, it was a lot of it was the fact that, you know, 90% of the solos were Jerry solos. But Melvin was so sick, and I, you know, caught the JGB years of Melvin Seals. Um, you know, John Kahn was there all, all the way through. Uh, Gloria Jones and Jackie Lip Branch were incredible. Uh, depending who was on uh, on drums at this time, when we're, from this show was David Kemper was still on drums. But Melvin, you know, there's certain songs where Melvin just took it so deep. You know, whether it was a, a Lucky Old Son or you know, sort of the funkiness, you know, that that he'd have in like a uh, Harder They Come. But you know, one of my absolute favorites is uh, is Mississippi Moon. And I know we've got a short clip of that, but the interplay, you know, between Garcia and Melvin, then kind of when he just lets Melvin take over, uh, Mississippi Moon's one of those ones where like a, a Hammond B3 just really comes in as just, it shows like the depth and range of how deep the bottom can be on a Hammond B3. Yep. Awesome. Um, well, if we've got it, Dan, let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's tee that one up for us. And we'll listen to that really fast too. I can uh, understand why you picked that clip. That's, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're right. When you pick a good show, any of these tunes, uh, you know, anytime can be good. But when you really have an opportunity to get one of those uh, at such a level like that, it's, um, well, I love the song and I love Jerry's version of it there. That's all I can say. Yeah, for sure. And that's one of those ones, like, as I said, like I always would look forward to a um, to a set that had either Mississippi Moon or Lucky Old Son in it because those are the two songs where like, Melvin just really got to let loose and just show how good he was on the organ. It wasn't, you know, electric piano. It wasn't, you know, like, um, you know, worlds or sounds. It was just pure B3. And uh, that's one of my, like, I love that organ sound. And I don't think there's too many people that I've seen uh, that are better at it than Melvin Seals. Like to this day, Melvin still has not Sure. Well, that's why people still go to see the Jerry Garcia band without Jerry Garcia, right? I mean, it's a good thing. People love it. So, um, so again, other things we don't do too often, Larry, is, you know, because it's Garcia's birthday, we're not really talking much cannabis this week. So I don't know if you got anything really exciting that happened in the cannabis industry this week, but yeah, you know, I wasn't really thinking too much about it. So I was like, all right, it's Garcia's birthday show. You know, we are the deadhead cannabis show, but once in a while you're more cannabis and once in a while you're more deadhead. 
and on this one specifically, I thought it made more sense to talk uh, talk about the music a little bit and just kind of, kind of celebrate the fact that you know Jerry would be eighty today, which is which is crazy to me. Like my mom is eighty now, um, you know, so it's you know, a, a number that I'm relatively familiar with. But it's hard to think that this would have been you know Garcia's eightieth birthday today. But anything uh, anything exciting in the canvas world for you? So you're right. I mean, we can't uh, we can't ignore the other side of our banner and. Um uh, the short answer is no. You know, unfortunately, there, there's nothing that we can come in and report like Senate sees the light and agrees to work together to pass the Safe Banking Act. You know, cannabis industry celebrates and blah, blah, blah. We don't have that. Um, and in Illinois, we still don't have licenses. So, you know, for all of their talk about we've broken the log jam and, and they're coming any day now, any week now, and, you know, whenever they'll be here. And, uh, you know, for the people in Illinois who are listening, uh, don't give up hope. And I'm sorry to sound like... Uh, such a negative Nelly, but you know, it, we have to get used to the state after a while and understand that even when they think they finally got it right, it still takes a long time, uh, you know, to really see the rewards of it. And uh, it will, we'll all benefit so much more when, when all of these new uh, uh, dispensaries and cultivation centers are out there and they join the competition and have to really find ways to make them stand out. And I think that that's when the, uh, you know, when, when the really quality strains start to show up and when the prices start to become a little more reasonable, uh, as as the the people who are trying to fight their way into the market uh, that up till now in Illinois, quite frankly, is pretty much dominated almost exclusively by the MSOs, and uh, you know it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, I think, for some of these new ones to to fight their way in. But you know, there's a lot of smart people out there who are running these things, and they work with smart people and, and folks who have uh, uh, access to great stuff. And um, you know, in that regard, I think it's just a matter of time before everybody figures it out. But we can keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best, right? Wasn't there just a grant though of 185 new licenses? Didn't I read that last week? Or is that just um, a, a misnomer that those are the same licenses that everyone's been keyed up and waiting for for a while that just still are kind of in stasis or flux? No, those are them. Those are absolutely them. And I, they you know, look, I, I, what was it a year ago? They came out all of a sudden in August one day and said, here, here's the names of the people who we say have won the licenses. And there was another big uproar. And then they kind of got all quiet again. So now they came out, you know, this year they told us, oh, starting in July, we're, you know, these licenses are all going to be released and everybody's going to start coming on board. And maybe it's happening, but I'm not hearing a whole lot about it. And, you know, they're not talking a lot about it. And there's no, you know, story on the news of here it is, the very first finally adult use cannabis dispensary license holder, you know, who's proudly displaying his license and now has, you know, his 180 days to get up and running and everything. And, you know, that's the stuff we should have been seeing two years ago. And by now, the only thing we should be talking about is, you know, whether three or 400 dispensaries is enough or whether we need another 200. Yeah, I don't think that uh, whatever Illinois has got right now, I don't think is nearly enough. The same way I don't think there's nearly enough in New York and, you know, not nearly enough in a lot of the other limited licensed states. Uh, that's why I think in some ways, you know, like Florida's done it right with the number of uh, retails that you're allowed to have. They've just done it wrong in the number of uh, total licensees you're allowed to have. There shouldn't be a cap on the number of stores. Like if you have a license, you should be able to open as many retails as you want if they require vertical integration. So I'm curious to see what happens in a state like you know New York right now. There's only 40 retail licenses, and you know maybe it jumps up to a, a couple hundred with adult use. Or Illinois, for instance, where I think you're capped at um, at at eight or ten if you're a, if you're a licensee. So you know how many more does that allow? Yeah, it's ten total. Okay, so you know with all these new licensees, like you know. What's the right number for stores in Illinois? I guess it's somewhere around four or five hundred. That's what we've all been thinking all along. You know, it, we we have such a tremendous market. We're surrounded by states that don't have programs of their own. Although Missouri is is going to be voting on adult use, I understand this fall, uh, so that can make a difference. There's certainly a lot of traffic from St. Louis over into Southern Illinois to those dispensaries, and you know, look, it it, it, it would it would just be great to see just so that. Those of us who have been involved in the cannabis industry here from the beginning can finally start focusing on things other than the rollout of the cannabis industry. You know, it's it, it's like you know we need to we need to start focusing on how how do we have an industry now and how are we going to get the rest of Illinois you know to accept it and to understand it and to normalize this as part of the state operation and you know so it doesn't have to run specials on the news every two weeks about oh my goodness look what the dispensaries are doing. You know, and, and we'll get there eventually, I think, I hope, but we're just, we're not there yet. But let me just take this and, you know, kind of grab this one. And um, we got to go in a different direction with cannabis today because today's Garcia's birthday and Garcia was a big, big cannabis guy. And, you know, we've talked about uh, the uh, Jerry Garcia, uh, the hand-picked uh, strains that are out there now, the, the guitar-shaped gummies, 
um, the uh, pre-rolls. Um, it, you know, all of his stuff, it's just really, really wonderful to see, uh, you know, even, even his, his flower that they sell, uh, and, you know, when I've been out there, I've been lucky enough to get my hands on, um, and, uh, shout out once again to Andy Greenberg and, uh, her uh, great work out there, Sharon Krinsky and everything and, uh, uh, helping set all of this up for us, Society Jane, uh, so that I can try these things from time to time, uh, makes me a lucky guy. So, um, but you know, all of his stuff is just so great and 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 really wonderful to have, which just goes to show, I think, that if you want to have really good commercial weed, and you're interested in taking the time to really put some standards in place and enforce them, it can be done. But on that note, we have to take a jump back even further and and turn back the uh, the wayback machine here, Mr. Peabody, so that we can go to uh, uh, Terry Haggerty, uh, who we were lucky enough to have on our show a few weeks ago, thanks to our good friend David Gans, who uh, who made the connection and. Uh, as David told us, Terry is, is a remarkable musician with a remarkable background, but uh, he's also remarkable and has really uh, made a name for himself in his own way in the cannabis industry through Hagalicious and and what he does and represents and the stories he told us about uh, his experiences with marijuana and what it meant to him and uh, how he was um, you know doing all of this and the good stuff he had back then and his desire to to to, to store strains and, and, and build up a collection of strains and seeds. Booty call may be the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Let's just say that. Uh, Terry was kind enough uh, to share a little bit with me. And uh, guys, when I tell you that I've been smoking flour for a long, long time, and you know my buddies will make fun of me sometimes that a couple of hits in, you know they're all passed out and I'm still going pretty strong. Not on this stuff. There's no way. Uh, but when I wrote back to David Gans and told him that, uh, and I think Rob, you had seen this, that he had wrote on this and commented on it, that his, his explanation was, is that Terry, uh, uh, puts out marijuana, uh, musical marijuana, I think is what he called it. And in fact, you know, after we, after I tried some, I put on, uh, one of the sons of Champlain tunes that freedom that we featured with his great guitar solo. And yeah, I felt like my head was singing right along to the music. So I, I shot him a quick thank you email and, uh, you know, He's a very humble guy, you know, couldn't be nicer about it all. But here's the thing, guys, and this is the stuff, right? Everybody talks about, I'm going to go to some Blue Dream. I'm going to go get some Super Purple Haze, Gorilla Gru, Skywalker. What about something called Booty Call? But forget about the name Booty Call because that's just something he probably slapped on there. It's a, <laughs> it's a mix between a 1969 China Colombian that's been crossed with a 74 Nagare short Afghani. I don't even know what to say about any of that, but obviously he's he's putting specific names and specific years on there. And I'm telling you something, this is just luck. This is a very lucky thing to have access to something like this. And, uh, you know, I'll thank Terry all day long for it, not just because he's doing it, but because uh, he was kind enough to let me in on it a little bit. And um, it, it's just great stuff. So shout out to Terry, shout out to Hagalicious, shout out to the Sons of Champlin. Uh, thank you all uh, uh, for doing this and, and you know, keep reminding us why uh, so many of us love marijuana and the, uh, the really good things that are out there with people who are really, truly interested in growing marijuana for the love of marijuana and not necessarily because it's a really good way to pay the mortgage. Not that there's anything wrong necessarily with doing that, but, you know, I think, you know, Terry walks the talk and talks the talk, and that's always great to see. So thank you to him. Um, but let's uh, refocus ourselves here for a minute right back on Jerry Garcia. And uh, as long as we're talking about all this, it's just worth remembering, reminding everybody the story that Terry told us about the time that somebody sent him eight one-pound balls of opium and he didn't want it. So he, he called up Garcia and wound up trading some of it for weed from Jerry. And Jerry was happy to get the opium and he was happy to get the marijuana. And the best part about the whole story to me, Rob, was that he uh, – it was as matter of fact, it would be like if I was talking to Dan and said, yeah, I talked to Rob the other day and, you know, we worked out this and we said, we're going to do that and blah, blah, blah. But he's talking about having this conversation with Jerry Garcia and, you know, that's, that's just cool in and of itself. Yeah, I agree. And it's so funny that a lot of the people that are on the show, the people that are in their, uh, you know, sort of daily lives that they speak to on a, on a daily basis, you know, whether they're people that are best mans mm -hmm. in their wedding or, you know, been over their house a thousand times or, you know, grew up with their kids. It's always funny how small the world is among deadheads and, and how many people we've gotten to know that, um, that have, you know, sort of been on the inside of a lot of this stuff. So it's really cool to see. Back to the music, though, man. Like, I don't know. How, I don't know how much you got to see Garcia Band in the early 90s, but there's two or three songs that are almost played, you know, almost every night. You know, Deal's probably six out of every, like, seven shows. 
but you know, sisters and brothers and, uh, and bread box were like played pretty much like almost every night. So I don't know if like how big a bread box fan you are, but one of the things I loved about uh, seeing Garcia man in the nineties was you're pretty much guaranteed to get a bread box in there and has such a funky like rhythm to it. And it's just so much fun as far as like that chuck 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 kind of move to it. But I don't know. Are you, you a big bread box fan there, Larry? I, you know, I, if, if it came off of Garcia's fingers onto the strings of a guitar, I'm a fan of it. Uh, bread box. Yeah. You know, again, that's one of those tunes that I never had any, you know, connection to in any way, shape or form really, but he picks it up and he plays it. And, you know, sometimes I feel tunes like that for him are almost like tunes that he, not that he's just noodling around on. Cause obviously, you know, he's up there playing, but, you know, especially when you'd be with the Garcia band, you know, maybe not even unlike what Trey would do sometimes where Garcia would just pick up a particular riff in his head and kind of start noodling around with it sometimes between songs. And every now and then it would take him into a direction. And I felt like that's where Breadbox came from a lot of the time, but it's, it, it to me, it's just a, it's a, it's a nice tune to add into the set. You know, it, 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 it's part of the mix, and more importantly, it's part of that expectation. If you're going to hear Garcia, even if it is every other night, you know, there's some tunes he could play twice a night, and I would be happy. Deal is one of them. Um, you know, I, I've never complained that you know Garcia played too many tunes too many nights in a row, and unless it was day job two nights in a row with the Dead, but that's another story. The one, the one thing I really like about this version is, you know, in the part that we're about to play. You can actually hear that, like, there's one or two bars of uh, "I second that emotion" being played. And I know, like, you always give me like a tough time, but going, oh, yeah, you know, you, like a lot of times people hear things in songs that might not be there. But I'm pretty sure when you listen to this first little bit of it, it it's very much "I second that emotion" before it goes back into the bread box. So, you know, Dan, if you've got a little bit of that um, of, of the bread box to queue up, let's listen to a bit of that, and we'll talk about it on the other side. <laughs> You know, that could very well be second that emotion. That's look again. We're talking about Garcia. It's his own stage, right? There's nobody up there with him. He could pluck out a couple of notes and just decide on his own at any minute, whether he wants to change direction, whether he wants to tee it up for the next tune. He's the master. Yeah. And the, the other thing that's, um, I always look at bread box the same way I look at Ico or, you know, some of the other, like more like Cajun Creole songs is there's a really like certain kind of playfulness that goes along with that tune that you don't get in a lot of other songs that are, you know, kind of, um, either, uh, harder songs or uh, more gospely songs, but Breadbox is probably of all the Garcia band tunes one of the most playful. Yeah, definitely. But, but that, but it is a playful tune. You know, by its very nature, I think it's a playful tune, and I love that. You know, he would pick up tunes. It's, it's like every now and then when he'd break out into whiskey in a jar, right? And you know, it's funny. I'd never really heard whiskey in a jar. I wasn't that familiar with it until I heard him doing it on. Uh, uh, when that uh, original uh, box set, this, whatever the very first box set they put out was, uh, So Many Roads or um, whatever it was called with the, like a, a five disc. Yeah, it was So Many Roads. It was a bonus track on So Many Roads. Right. And, and you're right. Well, you're right. At, at the very end, like right before the final uh version of so many roads from soldier field they had a quick in studio version of whiskey in a jar and it really caught my attention because you know i mean whatever there's garcia you know he, he was a guy who didn't like to practice very much and they're in a studio and he's you know and all of a sudden he just gets a tune and he just goes with it and i mean it wasn't that he just got the tune he obviously played it from time to time but i'm always just amazed at the number of other rock bands out there that have covered whiskey in a jar considering the type of tune it is i think it's it's just a lot of fun to hear you know all sorts of bands break into it all of a sudden yeah i think it was right after so many roads came out that uh that metallica started covering it it was one of those things like where so many dead is like they, they never heard the tune before until they heard the uh the, the garcia version where i think it was just him and grisman just messing around in in studio and then like you know a couple months later metallica played it and everyone's like whoa like that's a different take on that tune <laughs> well anything metallica touches is going to be a different take you know unless it's one of their own or something not to diss metallica in any way but that's just the the nature of the beast with them but yeah it's it's look i think that at his heart in his heart, you know, we've talked about, you know, Garcia's past and his upbringing and his influence of his father and, you know, the, the music that he heard, but he, he was, he was a musician, you know, he wasn't a rock star per se. He was a musician and he would have been a musician any direction he had to go in order to be able to make whatever living he could make being a musician. 
And as a musician, I think that he just appreciates this wide world of music that's out there. And, you know, that was always like we've, we've talked about how great it was that, you know, we'd be introduced to at least I would be introduced to whole new, you know, artists or, or sides of artists that I had never, you know, really imagined or heard because all of a sudden Jerry or the dead decided to cover them. And that was enough for me to go back and start listening to the band they were covering to find out why Garcia thought it was, you know, worth covering them. And, uh, uh, you know, as as a musician, I, th- I think that's where, you know, I really loved him the most, right? If he's just up on stage, just sitting playing his guitar and a, and a great guitar solo, he doesn't have to be moving. He doesn't have to be bopping around. He doesn't have to be doing anything. You know, it's, he's just putting out fantastic vibes, fantastic sounds. And, you know, I mean, I guess we can all try and put our finger on it. And I don't know that anybody ever really can, but, you know, suffice it to say that there's a large number of us all out there wandering around who, you know, would have to seriously consider whether or not we wouldn't want to give up one of our children for one more night, you know, to see Jerry Garcia in concert. And I love all of my boys and none of you, you don't go around fighting over who it would be, please. But um, can you imagine it's, it's been what, 30 years now, basically since he died 30 years since, you know, we could say, ah, everything sucks, but I'm going to see Garcia tonight. I'm going to see the dead with Garcia. I'm going to say JGB. I'm going to see anything or anybody. And, you know, I mean, it's, not like it's the kind of thing that needs to be on the front page of the news every day, but you know, and every now and then somebody will mention it, but time just slips right by. And now here we are, it would have been his 80th birthday, you know, and just, I I always had this image way back when I first started seeing them, like, you know, this is going to be really, really cool somewhere down the road when I'm in my, you know, fifties or sixties and Garcia's in his eighties. And, you know, we go to see him in some little theater and he's just sitting up there like in a rocking chair or whatever, just playing whatever little tunes on his acoustic. Now, of course, seeing how things really work in modern day world the idea that you know he would ever ever be able to play anywhere in a small theater for anything you know is is preposterous but sure you know that all would have been fun let me just quickly diverge here because that just made me think of one thing and you're an east coast guy so i gotta know what you think of this did you see the article on the um Bruce Springsteen tickets that went on sale. And according to Springsteen, the, people were showing up on, and the tickets were like $5,000 a piece and everybody was outraged. And so Springsteen's management group came out and said, oh no, this isn't scalpers. We now have a new program. And what the new program does is it adjusts the prices based on the demand, which I guess it, it, it's you know out there on the internet, pulling in all the data it can and runs its algorithms and decides when there's a high enough demand to jack up the price, the, the average price he said turned out to only be about two or $300, which we feel is very reasonable to see a man of Mr. Springsteen's talents. But meanwhile, it's cranking out tickets for $5,000. This is just insane. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. It's nuts. I mean, to, to, by way of comparison, the face value for the ticket of the show we're listening to tonight, the uh, 8192 from Irvine, was $24 on the face with a $3.25 Ticketmaster surcharge. So it's $27.25. And I had like, you know, 15th row at that show. And that was like, you know, there was no VIP ticketing then. There was no difference in price based on where you sat in the venue. It was, you know, one, like if you ordered early, you got the best seat and that was your bonus, right? It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to, you know, buy a super high priced tier of the first 20 rows being, you know, a thousand bucks a ticket for big like concerts now. Right. I think the whole thing is absurd. I, I, I think luxury in general in the United States right now is absurd. And I think that the whole world has turned into a VIP world of like, of, of status of like, like okay, I mean, like, and I'm guilty of it. You know, the last time, the, sure. the final sort of Garcia band shows um, where, you know, Gloria and Jackie were on, they called it like a road at the Warfield. It was, um, yep. you know, uh, fantastic. It was a couple of years ago. And, and I paid the highest price there was to have, you know, dead center first row of the balcony because like that was a venue that was so close to me and I knew which the best seat in the house was. And I just wanted to have those seats, but I left and I was like, did I really just support that? Did I really just spend like a hundred bucks a ticket, you know, to, to go see basically, you know, the members of the Garcia band just to be in the Warfield one more time. And the answer is it's, it, like, that's just the, the reality of where music's going right now. And it kind of sucks. Right. Well, it's true. I mean, I remember back in the what, early 1980s, I think it was, when the Eagles had a tour and they were charging $100 a ticket and everybody was outraged, $100 a ticket. You know, of course, you know, today everybody charges $100 a ticket, although you can still go see really good shows. I'll throw in a cheap plug here for Space in Evanston, Illinois, and their tickets are – in fact, Andrews Osborne is coming back in October and we may have to reach out to your buddy. Um, not to get tickets. I just want to see if he can tell me whether Andrews is going to be playing electrical or acoustic this tour. So um, – ah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm surprised the Veach hasn't gotten in touch with you yet. I figured the Veach would have called you when he was uh, when he was in Illinois. Okay. Well, I, you know, I always like to hear from him again. And, um, uh, but yeah, I think that, uh, he's definitely coming in spaces like seeing it in my basement. I mean, it's just so amazing and, and I'll see him no matter what, but I just, I'm really hoping that it's going to be an electrical set. I, you know, Anders on acoustic guitar is wonderful, but Anders on electric is like, it's electric. It, it, you know, he's not Garcia, but it's like seeing Garcia. It's a great, great show. And he just cranks it out for an hour and a half or two. And, you know, it's, you have a great time. So, hey, I want to bring you back to something you were saying earlier, which is, um, you know, the, all the different artists that you were introduced to as a result of, you know, being a Grateful Dead fan. But for me specifically, as a, as a Garcia band fan, there was so much that I learned about as far as gospel music that I learned about as far as like, you know, like just how much he covered of Jimmy Cliff, how much he covered of Van Morrison, how much he covered of just like, you know, a lot of obscure artists that, you know, but for I would have otherwise never known. Rhapsody in Red. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. But um, there's one artist in particular that we've never heard of named uh, uh, Daniel Langlois, who has written a lot of songs for um, for U2 and has you know, produced tons of people's albums. But like it was an artist I'd never heard of before until Garcia Band played The Maker. And I don't know if you're familiar with the song, but you know it's been covered by um, by Dave Matthews. It's been covered by, by Garcia. It's been covered by a handful of other people. The original version is just hauntingly, just amazingly beautiful. But I've always thought that Garcia's version of The Maker is is one of the absolute best. And it was one of those things that when I first heard it, I was like, you know, was this a Robert Hunter tune? And I looked it up and, and did the research and I've become a huge Dan Lloyd fan as a result of this song. So, you know, I don't know if, uh, if Dan, you can cue that one up, but let's listen to a little bit of the maker from, from Garcia's 50th birthday. <laughs> Another great tune. Um, you know, Garcia, you know, I think he takes people's music and does great things with it. That's a, that's a great selection. Yeah. Again, it has almost like the old gospel feel to it, but it's definitely much more of a, of a modern take on kind of a gospel idea. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of Canadian artists that have, that have really grown to love. And obviously like Neil Young would be, you know, sort of a prime example of it. But, you know, if you talk to Canadians, like the, the tragically hip or, you know, they're banned for years, but this is another one that I think is an understated Canadian artist that, uh, that you forget about, and Garcia's take on on his music uh, is incredible. So, you know, I highly recommend it for anyone out there that doesn't um, know Daniel's music to go check it out. But you know, starting with the Maker is a great place to start, and it's such it's a song that's tailor made for the background uh, singers of, of Gloria and Jackie in that song because, like, the way they're able to to sort of harmonize with Garcia is um, is so pretty. Now, it, it's when you say that, the first thing that it makes me think of is the Garcia band covering Bruce Coburn's Waiting for a Miracle, which I think is the same type of song and, you know, perfectly tailored uh, for, for the Garcia band and, and his background singers. And I had heard that for a number of uh, number of times, uh, but had never had a chance to ever hear Bruce Coburn do it. And then too many years ago to count, so probably 25 years ago when my kids were really, really small, uh, we were lucky one summer to be out in Amagansett visiting our good friends, Tom and Julie. And uh, they took us to the Stephen Talk House one night out there. That's a little place that has a reputation for bringing in big artists. I love that place. It's it's such a great venue. I love the Talk House. I, I, I loved going there and it was so exciting. And Bruce Coburn came in and right in the middle of his set, he whipped into Waiting for a Miracle. And I knew it wasn't Garcia's, but I guess I had never really quite realized at the time that it was Coburn's. And after that i always did but it, it, it was such a great show and 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 he was so good and uh you know great venue great place to see it um but you know i, I think that's that's the great thing about jerry you know he finds those types of uh 
he, he finds those types of songs that, that he can just really take a hold of that have a little bit of an emotional moment in them or a little bit of, you know, like grit in them. And he, he takes it. He does really good things with that music. And you're exactly right, by the way, that, you know, Bruce Coburn's Waiting for a Miracle and uh, in, in Lang Lewis, um, The Maker, have a really, really similar feel to them. I mean, they're very different tempo wise. But as far as like what the vibe is and kind of, what, you know, what the take of, um, of music is, they're, they're both, you know, really kind of gentle, kind songs of hope um, on both of them uh, and, and sort of self-reflection songs as well. So like and two of my favorites, but that's a really good comparison between those two songs. Yeah, it's just, you know, it, it, it you know, it's kind of like those guys who joke, well, I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. I should just say, you know, well, I am a deadhead, right? If you say you're a deadhead, that kind of answers the question as to how you sit around and talk about all of this stuff because it all, it, it was brought to us. You know, I didn't have to go out and search for this music. I just listened to Jerry Garcia and God love him. He brought all of this wonderful music to my front doorstep so I could listen to it all and, and, and you know, and, and learn about it and, and go out and see these people. Uh, you know, like Bruce Coburn or anybody else and, and get such a deeper appreciation for all of their music, right? I love Warren Zevon, but, you know, the way Jerry covers Werewolves of London always pulls me. Whenever I hear Jerry play it, I go right back listening to Warren for a few days. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's, it's so funny you say that because there's so many times where I'll listen to a take on a song that he plays that makes me want to go back and listen to the original artist again uh, as a result of, like, hearing his version of it. And then The Maker actually is one that that certainly happens to me frequently. But not only do I go back and listen, you know, to uh, to, to uh, Daniel's version, but I, I listen to, and I'm not a Dave Matthews fan, but I listen to Dave Matthews' version as well, and I look for anyone else's version that's been out there. Sort of the same way I would with, like, you know, Bernstein's Hallelujah. Like, there have been so many amazing takes of that, and whether you listen to the Jeff Buckley version or you listen to, you know, there's different different people that have covered that song, and each one of them has got such a unique take on it that you want to hear all of them, just to kind of understand um, the evolution of how people interpret a specific piece of music. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think that that's very true. And, you know, that was, I guess that was the thing about the Dead, since I already liked their style and I already liked their sound, uh, the fact that they were playing the tune, you know, in their own style, you know, kind of helped me with the transition of going over. But then there was the curiosity of hearing it, you know, the way it was originally meant to be played. You know, and, and, I, and, I, and I have to say that's, that's probably true for me with almost every song they play, with, with the possible exception, and I say this not meaning to be mean or anything, but, you know, if you ever listen to, to Bonnie Dobson's version of Morning Dew, it's really kind of hard on the ears. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. So, um, okay, man. Well, geez, I'm not even paying attention to the time here. We've gone through almost all of our clips. But but shortly after taping this tomorrow morning, I'm heading out to Boulder, Colorado for uh, my good buddy Mike's 60th birthday. We've been having a whole bunch of these this year. It's like having bar mitzvah parties, but doing it when you're 60. And, uh, you know, it's one every weekend. It's really kind of fun. And we're going to be in Boulder, but uh, Friday night we're all uh, heading over to Red Rocks to see uh, Tedeschi Trucks with Los Lobos opening. So that is going to be uh, a very exciting evening. And I will be talking about this on the next episode, even though by the time you guys hear it, it'll be probably about a week late. But you'll get to hear my inside analysis of uh, Derek Trucks and Susan Tedeschi and um, all the guys in Los Lobos and whatever wonderful music they're going to crank out for us. So... Uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. And now uh, everybody's getting excited here for uh, Fish is Coming just in a couple of weeks. And uh, I'm going to be heading up to those shows with my kids and my wife may even go for a night. And um, nothing like Alpine Valley summertime music and Fish, man. If you can't see the dead, I'd just as soon see them. Nice. Well, I'm really jealous, Larry, that uh, you're getting to do all that. I've been stuck on the island out here where music scene's not that great, but everything else is pretty fantastic. So, you know, definitely having a, a great summer. What I will say is, you know, it's it's great to be on the air with you for Jerry's birthday. Um, you know, truly wish that man was uh, was still here playing with us. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll say one of my favorite things about the Garcia Band in, in this era, and I told you we'd go back to a shining star at the end of the show again, is the way the Grateful Dead had not fade away, where the crowd would sing back during "Not Fade Away" and you know, kind of let the uh, the band know how much they loved him. Um, for the Garcia Band, it was shining star. And, you know, if you listen to the really sort of slow, like loping intros to Shining Star and kind of the buildup, when they started toning it down, starting right around this, you know, right around mid-1992, so they only started playing it, I think, in like 89 or 90, maybe maybe even 91. But around mid-92, they started slowing it down right at the end and letting the crowd sing back to them. And by like 93 or 94, like the singbacks would sometimes be four or five minutes long. But in this particular show, um, you know, you got maybe a minute of it. But it's always one of those things that's really, really fun to listen to. So, you know, after you say goodbye and, and you know, tune out for next week and I do the same, 
Um, we're going to listen to a little bit more of August 1st, 1992 from the Irvine Amphitheater for Jerry Garcia's 50th birthday. And as always, you know, uh, this will be my sign off. Um, thanks for tuning into the Deadhead Cannabis Show and really appreciate everyone that listens to it and hopefully you dig the music that we're trying to find for you and the topics that we're covering. But, you know, happy birthday to, uh, to Jer and um, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, happy birthday to Jerry. Uh, and, of course, for those of you keeping score at home, uh, today does mark the beginning of the days between, uh, which are the days between uh, Jerry's birthday and his passing, which is next uh, Monday, August 9th. Um, and we will be here with a new episode on that day, and I think it's probably fair to say uh, that we will once again focus a, a large majority of our time on Jerry Garcia, on his music, uh, and, and maybe focus a little bit on, you know, uh, his passing and you know what it all really means to all of us and you know where we are today in the music world and and, and what we're looking for so um if you if you want to hear a lot of jerry garcia music listen to the uh dead sirius xm channel uh because during the days between they go very very heavy on the jerry garcia stuff and there's never too much jerry garcia stuff uh for you to be able to listen to. So thank you to Dan uh, Hummiston. Thank you to Rob Hunt for putting together such a great show today. And um, for all of our listeners, uh, have a great week. We'll talk to you next week and enjoy your cannabis responsibly. Thanks, everyone.